Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming here. And what I have is a skull and heap view. This is actually looking from what's now Camden, looking across at Philadelphia. And you can see Christ Church. And what we're going to do now is move to the south to Independence Hall. And the other great thing about this is you can really see the prominence that these towers played in the skyline of Philadelphia. Uh, I always like to show a picture of Independence Hall when I'm talking about it, but I also want to reinforce that uh, the Chestnut Street elevation is the front of the building. A lot of times we forget this in historic buildings, so I always want to start with the front of the building. And this photograph is from before in the 1880s, 1890s, before we, uh, the Robert Mills uh, business wings were taken down. The other thing I have to say is most of what I know about the tower is due to Nick Giannopoulos and just the multiple times that we went up in taking tours, looking at things. And one of the first things he always said is when they started working on restoring Independence Hall, they weren't going to White House, Independence Hall or the tower. And I just wanted to give you an idea of what that really meant. This is a picture of the inside of the White House during the restoration of the Truman administration. Uh, it's not quite the Secretary of the Interior standards about reversibility. Uh, the earliest known f uh, drawings that we have of Independence Hall is this one by, uh, in John Dixon's papers and is attributed to Al Andrew Hamilton, and if you go up in the attic, uh, there is the layering of structure, which I think is important, and right in here, you can see the opening for the cupola that was originally up on the roof. The other thing, one of the last projects Penny Batchelor did was to actually try and figure out what Independence Hall looked like before a tower was added. The tower was actually a building addition, and what she did was use photographs, also looking at Woolley, who built the tower, at previous buildings to try and figure out what Independence Hall's south elevation might have looked like. Here are a whole series of sketches and studies her final sort of conjectural study of what it might have appeared like. And then we move to the good stuff, which is the tower that was uh, commissioned and started being built in 1750 through 1754. Unfortunately, uh, one of the things is towers are very fragile. They're up against the weather, the elements. And here are some other graphic images of it. And what happens is by the uh, 1790s, the tower's in such bad condition, the wood portion, that it actually has to be taken down. But recently, when we'd removed the windows at the third level of the tower, which is here, what we actually found, and it doesn't come across too well, but are the actual holes where they pegged in the louvers that they'd put in those window openings when they moved the bell down. They'd put in the louvers to actually help the sound from the ringing of the bell come out. And then by uh, 1828, there's a, uh, Philadelphia is again uh, very much interested in Independence Hall and they have a comp they have, they hire William Strickland to come in and build a new wood steeple on, on the existing brick base. And what I did was I actually took Keystone Hood's conjectural uh, reconstruction of the original tower. And you can see it's a series of boxes stacked on top of one another. It has a lot of joints, very fragile. And as Nick said, that the skin is applied directly to the structural members. When uh, Strickland comes in, he creates these two uh, superstructures that go up. You can see these very stable. It's very much simpler. And then the dash line actually shows how the exterior cladding is held away from the interior structure. 
The other thing is Strickland is very much of a different age. It's, the, it's an age of innovation. And he starts doing all sorts of things that are different. One of the major things he does is he changes the construction technique. As you can see uh, down below in the lower portion, this is the 1750s tower. It's all mortise and tenon construction. This is very expensive, time consuming. And Strickland comes in for cost savings and also innovation. All of his joints are all bolted connections. So the whole tower, when you get to all of the major structural framing members, are all bolted. And you can sort of see how the knee braces, everything's bolted together. It's much easier to do. You can lift everything up into place, bolt it. It's much similar to a steel building. You can also see how the framing, the structural framing with the knee braces is back pulled in away from the outer skin of the wall. And uh, this is an axonometric just showing of where we're really going to focus, which is Strickland's levels of four, five, and six. There are both a lot of uh, innovative things going on here and some things that actually caused problems when we came to uh, actually do the restoration of the tower. One of the things that he did, and we didn't know when we started doing the work actually what purpose uh, the iron rods, which are here, embedded in the center of the cladding. Each cladding piece is two and three quarter inches thick and it's eastern white pine old growth and they overlap. And we didn't know if this was a prefabrication technique whether we put panels together then lifted them in the air or if these rods somehow were something for shear. So one of the things we did, oh, the other thing that was really great is he built in sort of a natural drainage system, which was with these beveled joints that uh, the, tr the cladding actually drains itself. So, you know, I'd run up there in the middle of a rainstorm with a moisture meter, poke it around, I'd get very high readings. The next day and the day after, I'd go back. And um, so what actually happens is when it rains, at this joint here, it actually drains out. And the only problem we found is that uh, previously they had gone to thinking weather tighten these joints had actually caused and had actually installed sealant. We came back during the work and found that those areas where they'd installed sealant was actually where we were getting rot. In sort of wondering uh, where this idea came from for embedding the iron rods, uh, we started looking at what Strickland had previous experience in. In 1824, he was sent to England to look at canal building. And uh, we think this may have influenced his building of the tower, that he took some of the details that he saw in canal building and actually translated them into the building of the tower. This is an example of his uh, patent for a lock. Uh, this is an actual aqueduct that's on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. And here again, you can actually see iron rods that are embedded in the wood to hold things together. The other thing I did was I dragged my mother on one vacation up to Shittenango Canal Boat Museum. It's along the Erie Canal. And what they have there are canal boats. And canal boats are basically wood boxes. Uh, they have, uh, what they would do is in the winter, they would mill the wood in the, and do iron bars, the bolts, the nails, that sort of thing. And so you can actually see we have a very similar profile with uh, the beveled siding on the outside. We have the knee braces and actually sunk in the Erie Canal, you can see where the iron rods are coming up out of a board. This is a late 19th century canal boat. And what I'm trying to do is find examples now that maybe go earlier into the 19th century. And the one pic corner picture is actually of Independence Hall. And you can see the similarity of construction. 
Well, one thing we did was we tried to figure out with the water moving in and out of the wood clanting, what was happening to those iron rods. So we got up there, we did uh, basically x-rays of the cladding at various spots. And what we found was where we didn't have water, the iron rods were pretty much intact. But then when you come up to a joint where you get water infiltration, what you start to see is the deformation. And here, iron, is the rust is actually bleeding into the wood. And what that causes is caused iron sickness. And iron sickness, it's a term that comes out of railroad construction, actually causes the wood fibers to break apart and will lead to the failure of the wood. And this x-ray here is actually in that very location. So what we did was we decided to actually start taking the, power, the tower apart. And so we removed everything. And what I have is before shots that you can actually see. We took all the wreaths off, laid them out on a table, inspected each piece of wood. There's what the condition of the wreath was after it's stripped. And here on this side is actually the wreath being reinstalled. You have a pilaster capital on one side prior to restoration, after restoration, and reinstalled. Down on the uh, 18th century tower, actually, when we got to the wood capitals, we found out that they probably cut corners because rather than using a single block of wood, what they did was in the shop, they took pieces of wood varying sizes and glued them all together and then carved the capital. So what happens is when we started stripping it, the wood glue came apart. All of the capitals completely fell apart. We had to take them into the shop, re-glue them, reinstall them. Uh, the first thing we did to make sure about uh, installing uh, the cladding properly was did shop drawings. Each piece of uh, cladding is, was measured, numbered. You can see the rods were all draft, were all located. This is both for level six, level five. Initially we went through and just did an eye survey to see if there was actually cladding that we could save. The gray are the members that we thought we couldn't save because of the bowing out and the expansion due to and the uh, falling apart of the wood fibers due to the iron sickness. We then each took each elevation, put it down on the ground, and surveyed each board. And what we actually, this is an example of the iron sickness, where you can see that the wood fibers have actually become like hair coming apart, but then what we discovered was in the basin and the tops, we actually got iron jacking. And this long crack there is actually from the expansion of rust and split the boards apart. And at one point, just to, we did a, got a sample of the cladding, but what we actually uncovered was, this is a typical iron rod, you can see how it's great here, and then when it gets to this, it actually has lost its entire thickness. And this is probably the most spectacular photograph I've taken because this is, you are now seeing what was only seen before in 1828, where the cladding is completely off, the structure is completely exposed, and as Nick said, we've sacrificed the outer skin, but the structure is actually completely intact. There's some areas where we had to reinforce with some new structure here and there. You can see some uh, 60s structure, if it were clear, that was uh, in to address some problems, but uh, this is really great. And actually, when I pointed it out to the carpenters, all of a sudden, a myriad of cell phones came out, and they started recording it. Uh, I put this in because one of the things that we were actually insisted on doing was duplicating the construction. So we actually went out and got old growth, eastern white pine, specified the number of rings, and then duplicated 
the construction where we overlap the rods. Instead of putting them in iron to relieve the problem, we use stainless steel, put in the bolts. At the corners, we duplicated the construction here, whether it was beveled or uh, butted. And then the one thing we did do at various locations was install new lead-coated flashing to help drainage of water. And finally, down in this corner, began to work with flashing and how to reinstall the wood wreaths. The other thing I thought in all of the pictures, it's good to actually see master builders. And these are all carpenters that are working on the scaffolding, installing the new cladding. We even have uh, one carpenter down here, a carpenter's apprentice, who's not only getting trained on the site, but here is actually coming and tightening down one of the screws. We planed down the wood, sanded it, and prepped it for uh, painting. And finally, this is the stage we're at now. We're almost complete. The wreaths installed, all of the decorative uh, members that have been conserved are reinstalled. And finally, we're pretty much on date. We may be done a little bit sooner uh, than we thought. I think scaffolding may come down, cross my heart, in uh, the end of November. That's what I hope. I think we have substantial completion maybe around the 20th or something of November. And finally, I always like to end with this, which is this ad that I found, which I think really sort of typifies Philadelphia and what's going on in the city. Was that too quick? No, that's fine. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. And uh, Nick will join us towards the end of uh, this discussion of Franklin Court. And I, I, we've called this the evolution of Franklin Court, but in a way, it's it's a great case study in the shifting or sort of the evolution of attitudes towards both preservation uh, and interpretation, and in the case of Franklin Court, also commemoration. So Franklin Court, uh, as it exists today, uh, in 1950, looked like this. This was Oriana Street, uh, looking north. Uh, obviously, the area had evolved significantly since Franklin's time and had become part of the uh, industrial, commercial, uh, old city uh, that, that largely exists today. Oops. Uh, this is Market Street as we know it today. This was Market Street as it was in 1950, uh, just before uh, work, actually just, just before the Park Service gained control of the site in 1948. So this will be a discussion of how we went from here to there. This is a wonderful uh, in print drawing by uh, Frank Taylor done in 1915. Uh, again, this is a view from Oriana Street uh, looking north. In 1812, Franklin had sold his property and uh, his, actually his heirs divided the court into 30 house lots filling the court, and Oriana Street uh, was created. There was a lot known about Franklin Court, uh, primarily through deeds and the wonderful insurance surveys that uh, exist and lots of correspondence. Much was known about the house, and they knew where it was. Uh, and as the sesquicentennial approached in 1940, there was kind of a renewed interest in this idea of commemorating Franklin and also restoring the house. Uh, as uh, Dr. Richard Shyrock, who was a librarian at the American Philosophical Society, said at the time, Franklin is a man we cannot leave to the imagination. <laughs> that was a great quote. Um, in 
uh, back to 1950. In 1948, the Congressional Subcommittee hearings were uh, taking place to basically to establish the park in Philadelphia. It was broken into segments, uh, and um, there was a particularly kind of interesting dialogue at the congressional he hearings regarding the purchase of this particular piece of the park. And uh, I'm going to quote a little bit from this. Uh, Representative Scott says, I think that this is one site, is it not, where there is a possibility of reconstruction because they have not only the old wall, but they have enough detail of Franklin's home to reconstruct. Mr. Rockwell says, what would be the cost of that for the building and reconstruction? No one is more an admirer of Ben Franklin than I, but I wondered if there was not some place to add value other than just a lot, 20 by 30, and a wall that is more or less fallen down. <clears throat> a little further in, in the discussions, um, with his, Mr. Scott says, with the historical knowledge that is in the hands of the Philadelphia Historical Society, I feel that, it if, that if this area in Project C, it could be put to great proper use in giving the people of the country an opportunity to see the environment in which Ben Franklin lived in his own immediate personal life. Then uh, another uh, representative, there is one further consideration that weighed heavily on us the fact that there is no national memorial or shrine to Benjamin Franklin in the national park system, and there are to most, in some way, our great historical figures have been commemorated, but Franklin has not been. So you see this complex idea of memorial, of reconstruction, what, what should we do? Um, again, Mr. Rockwell, not to be denied, he is certainly one of our great Americans and did a great deal. Still, a vacant lot full of weeds, 20 feet square, to spend a half a million dollars? It seems there might be some better monument we could get. Sort of how right he was in some ways, but... <laughs> uh, then again, Mr. Barrett, uh, I think in the end, uh, the chairman says, the importance, too, of this little house if you read the dimensions, it was not a fabulous place at all, but a little house, which eventually found necessary to expand. But in any event, it looks to me like it is a historic site, and one if we, if we cannot restore it, at least we should be, it should be preserved properly, whatever that means. It seems to me that it is properly included, and I would like to move, Mr. Chairman, that we include Project C. Shortly thereafter, began a series of um, archaeological excavations to, uh, to determine, actually let's go back, to determine really what existed, what, what might be found to help in this uh, restoration or recreation or commemoration. Uh, in 1953 and 1955, the National Park Service archaeologist Paul Shoemaker uh, was able to undertake very limited excavations. He was not allowed to dig in Oriana Street. He was able to dig in the sidewalk on the, some of these empty lots and in the uh, basements that existed. Uh, his excavations concluded that there was no rising wall of Franklin's house. Uh, in fact, that the basements on both sides of the houses built by Franklin's heir had gone deeper than uh, than Franklin's house and had obliterated basically all of the remains. Uh, however, he did find under the sidewalk a piece of an east wall foundation. Shortly after, this, uh, in 19, oops, seem to have lost an image here. In 1958, uh, actually the 
Park Service was able to demolish the houses, and in 1960 and 61, excavations under the guidance of Bruce uh, Powell, uh, the, the archaeologist, located additional foundations describing the east, north, and south walls, privies, and, and other uh, appurtenances to Franklin Court. He also was able to excavate under the, in the basements of some of the Market Street houses, and uh, found, again, some evidence that there were remains of the earlier structures along Market. There we go. Uh, those, uh, those excavations became part of a historic structures report that was published in 1961. Uh, Dennis Kerjack was the acting park superintendent at that time and issued this report. And uh, the work uh, the archaeological discovery seemed to lend great optimism to the possibility of actually reconstructing Franklin's house. And from his report, I'll read this to you, a great deal is already known about the physical history of the house, and there is every expectation that further research will provide us with the near complete knowledge of the structure. A wealth of archaeological data and artifacts, including foundations of the east, north, and south walls, an east-west portion which divided the basement into sections, remains of a circular ice house, the necessary, and fragments of building materials would permit reconstruction of the house on the exact site of the original and a high degree of accuracy in the use of construction material. Well, what, what did they really know? Uh, they had some of the foundations uncovered. This was the only extant drawing known uh, of the plan of the house, and this is believed to have been done by Ben Franklin on the backside of a document that existed at the American Philosophical Society. And you can see the house. This was actually the north side, a stairwell, a large dining room, two parlors, and, a, and an off-center hallway. Um, there is. I guess these are considered to be windows, doors, chimney, 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 table. <laughs> uh, and I guess based on a lot of the descriptions of the house, people, uh, historians are actually able to glean a lot from this little sketch. But from this sketch, uh, as get in the Crayjack Historic Structures Report, um, this, again, unbridled optimism, this is uh, the uh, staircase as it could be reconstructed um, from the information that, that we know. And I, I, this was a very simpler time. This was a preliminary estimate of cost. <laughs> $590,200, and I wonder where the $200 came from. Well, in uh, beginning in, actually after that report, the site stayed fallow for some time. And uh, then beginning in, in 1970 through 1973, uh, Barbara Leggett uh, undertook additional excavations on the, on the site. You can see some of the, um, the coverings over the, the earlier work that uh, had been done. Barbara Leggett's excavations brought out a lot more detail about, uh, about more about the uh, time of Franklin, all of the materials that were found in the privies, um, but really did not uncover much of real significance in terms of the, uh, what Franklin's house uh, looked like. I think the, a garden wall was uncovered. A lot of inf more information was gleaned about the Market Street uh, houses, including uh, definite um, locations of foundation walls and party walls that continued to exist. So in, in 1970, what really did, did what, had, what had been discovered? And essentially, this is, uh, to the left here is Franklin's house, and to the north are the Market Street houses. And you can see in dark, these are the fragments of foundations that were found, uh, and you can see they neatly correspond to where Oriana Street was. Really, most of the information that was found survived only because it was under the street, not disturbed by basements. 
Um, you can see bits of the garden wall that were found here, then a whole series of test pits and many, many privies um, and, and other kind of storage devices. So the excavation material along with descriptions uh, enabled um, this sort of sketchy reconstruction of the site. These came from Barbara Liggett's report. Uh, ben Franklin began assembling his properties in the, 19, in the 1730s uh, to, build, uh, to build his house. Uh, his house was built in, or began in, 19, in 1763 with uh, Robert Smith as carpenter and Samuel Rhodes as supervisor. Uh, it's unclear, both of those uh, were architects as well as builders. It's unclear who actually designed the house, but both were involved. The house was completed in 1766, three years in the making, uh, much to the dissatisfaction of Franklin. And then between, uh, between uh, the 1763 and 1780s, uh, Franklin acquired the properties uh, along, some of the properties along Market Street. You can see originally when he, the house was built, he actually had a drive that came in to the uh, west and entered the, the court. Um, to the north, he acquired three houses that existed um, on Market Street, and he never gained ownership of these, these two uh, abutting properties. Then in 1886, uh, the print shop was built, a library was added to his house, and he demolished the three houses on Market Street and built the, uh, the houses that uh, are reconstructed today and created the covered passage that current is, is now there that enters uh, the courtyard. He then built a, a third house on the previous site of his driveway. So after all of this, uh, the bicentennial was approaching, and um, still this question remained. What did Franklin's house look like? This is from uh, early 19, from 1972, I believe. Uh, they were desperate to find more information about what the house looked like. We are going to make a worldwide search for anyone having a watercolor or anything else which will help show us what the house looked like. For the loan of such picture, the commission will trade an all-expenses-paid trip to Philadelphia, <laughs> a visit to Franklin Court and a specially designed Franklin Medal. Well, I guess that was not incentive enough to produce any more information. Um, the only real image that, that um, seemed to exist was this ad advertisement in, from 1790 seven for the rental of Franklin's house. In the meantime, there were continued, um, so sort of the process of thinking about how do we, what can we do? We don't have much, uh, we have no real substantial information about what the house looked like. Uh, we know what its footprint was. Uh, we know more, a little more about the, the Market Street houses. All the way back in the 50s, actually, this was uh, after the preliminary excavations. This is hard to see, but this is a wonderful Grant Simon uh, idea about how the, the uh, Franklin might be memorialized. It's essentially a garden with just the walls of the house brought up to probably about um, you know, waist height and a little museum tucked tucked in the niche here. He did about three or, three or four of these schemes. Uh, in, the 19, in the late 1960s, Penny Batchelor, who uh, was a park historical architect at the time, came up with her notion of what might, uh, how these, uh, this site might be uh, interpreted and uh, not reconstructed. And you can see she was a student of Mies and she has, a, has proposed a sort of a, a, a Miesian box that sits over the remains, very transparent, and allows you to actually see, see in. 
And again, uh, the program was getting larger. The museum now started uh, having, a, the museum was accompanied by a lecture hall. Um, the program was obviously growing. Uh, this is another actually wonderful sketch by Penny Batchelor that shows the Market Street houses realized in uh, Corten steel. Um, 